In this segment, we're going to talk about model probing. So probing is a different form of explanation than we've been looking at in that it's more a way of analyzing the kinds of representations that our models are using, which gives us some idea maybe of why predictions are arising, but it's a little bit less explicit than some of the other techniques we've been looking at. So essentially our goal is to figure out what kinds of information are being preserved in a neural network. And the way we can do that is we can take intermediate representations from the network and then try to predict that information out of those. So what we're seeing on the right here is a pre-trained encoder model uh, producing these blue vectors. And we can aggregate these into representations. Well, we can either grab token representations or aggregate these into span representations and put these through a very simple classifier. So we might use a neural net with one hidden layer, for example. And then we'll try to predict something like, say, part of speech tags or dependency relations or something like that. And the idea behind this is that by using a simple classifier, we are forcing most of the heavy lifting to happen in this pre-trained encoder. And if the model is able to do well, it indicates that these blue vectors being passed in are pretty good. Now, one critical thing here is that we're going to keep this pre-trained encoder and these blue vectors frozen. We're not going to like back propagate into them as we would if we were trying to build a good model for this task, because what we're saying is, all right, given this existing model, how well can we predict this information from it? Um, and so kind of changing the model to make it predict better is, is a little bit defeating the purpose of this experiment. So uh, in some work from uh, the, one of the Johns Hopkins University summer, uh, basically summer kind of research series, they looked at having a set of tasks that they would put through, that, that they would use to probe the representations of a bunch of different pre-trained models. And so here are the results for BERT base. So what they have on the left side is a uh, so-called lexical baseline, which just uses glove embeddings or essentially context-independent representations from uh, the model, from the BERT model itself. Then they look at how much of a gain there is from the actual contextualization. And so uh, that's what's shown in the next two columns here. And the conclusion here, if you look at the average for these different tasks, is that contextualizing these vectors with BERT leads to a very large performance increase across these different tasks. And so we can also understand certain things, like for example, if we look at the part of speech row on the top, the kind of individual predictions actually aren't very good. These, uh, you know, we can't tell a lot about a word's part of speech in isolation, but then the predictions from the contextualized representations are quite good, around 97. And so the takeaway here is that this model seems to preserve part of speech information, and because we can read it out from the representations that we get using a fairly simple classifier. And then, you know, we can look at other aspects of this, like, for example, constituency, and see that the results are a little bit lower. This might indicate that, ha that trying to kind of aggregate over spans is a little bit less reliable, and the model has a bit less of an idea of what the kind of relation between these different units is, even though it's still doing quite well, uh, you know, given that we're essentially taking some off-the-shelf representations and feeding them into a fairly shallow model. So we can look at these results and, and, and again, try to kind of decode what's going on, and, and it lets us compare different pre-trained models and assess their strengths and weaknesses. So some, some other work uh, from Google showed that the basically this kind of idea can also be used to understand how BERT relates to the conventional NLP pipeline, uh, where you know we might think that, okay, the first thing we run is a part of speech tagger, then we run a parser, then we extract entities, and then we you know, figure out the relations between those entities and co-reference. Uh, 
Um, and so what they did was they looked at all the different layers of BERT and they probed those layers for which, uh, for basically for being able to solve each of these tasks. And what they see here in purple, they have the kind of delta from the mean representation using representations from that particular layer. And so in part of speech at the top, for example, we see this very high purple bar to start with, uh, which then drops off. And what that shows is that early on in the network, the representations are much, much better at predicting part of speech than they are later. What this says is that you know, early on, the, mo the model forms some representations that have a lot of information about part of speech in them. And then those representations gradually become uh, less and less uh, aware of part of speech. But other things kind of pick up after a while. For example, the second to last one here, semantic role labeling, uh, does well pretty close to the input, but then also kind of in the middle of the network. And then uh, coreference resolution at the bottom is sort of doing okay throughout. And so they, the title of their work is BERT Rediscovers the Classical NLP Pipeline. And so their argument is that there's a little bit of the same progression of tasks going on inside the model in that it's you know, first learning to do simple low level things and then building up more and more complexity. So while this is not an explanation in the sense that it doesn't tell us why the model made a particular prediction, it does give us some insight into what BERT is doing. And we can start to think about like, okay, we think BERT has the capability to do co-reference resolution, for example. So when we look at a task like multi-hop reasoning that requires resolving references, we can think, okay, well, BERT is able to do co-ref, and so this task involves co-ref, and so I think that BERT should be a good model that works well here. And my understanding when it gets the right answer is that it might be doing that due to co-reference. This reasoning is not, you know, a, it, it's, it's a little bit hard to apply, and there's reasons why you can't just uh, take all these conclusions at face value. Um, there are some issues with probing where, you know, if you start building very sophisticated probes, suddenly those have a lot of parameters in them, and uh, it kind of complicates the story. But in general, this is another useful tool in our toolbox for trying to understand what these models are doing and giving us a sense of uh, just what's going on inside these super complicated uh, pre-trained models. That's the end of this segment.